Welcome to my viewfinder. My name is David Young. We have new episodes every Friday. I've decided to start adding projects or challenges at the end of each episode, so don't forget to check that out. Let me know how you're doing in the comment section, or you can find me on Instagram at my viewfinder podcast, on Twitter at MVF podcast, or you can just email me at dunphoto at gmail.com. What do you get when you take a college and national level athlete, evolve him into an engineer, then a PhD student, a hiker, and then a photographer? You get Ryan Wilkes, professional birder. Sorry, I meant photographer. If you look at Ryan's work, you'll see cinematic and beautiful moments of both wildlife and remote locations. I mean, this man referred to Mount Kilimanjaro as a nature hike. But mostly you're about to hear how his life experiences led to his connection with nature and how his educational and professional past inform a research-based aim to get us into nature, first through his images and then, hopefully, with our feet. I don't like birds very much, I think it's their weird eyes. But after talking to Ryan, it's safe to say that I'm interested in meeting a few more just to make sure. Uh, apparently they're pretty cool. Especially his favorite bird, the sheep-eating New Zealand kia. Have a listen. Here's the first part of my talk with Ryan Wilkes. How about this? I haven't really asked this a lot, but do you, are you one of these people that has a bucket list? Or have you thought about something like that? Is there something that uh, might be at the top of a bucket list? Um, I, you know, in the, in the traditional sense... I probably don't have a bucket list. Like I don't have this list kind of sitting somewhere that I'm like, okay, what am I going to do next? What am I going to take off next? Because things are always changing for me and there's always different things that I want to do. But uh, at the moment, one thing that is quite near the top of my list is a trip to K2 base camp. Ooh. And yeah, K2, for those who don't know, is the second highest mountain in the world. And it's in the Karakoram, um, north, northern India slash Pakistan. And uh, I just finished reading a book about K2, and I've just become mesmerized uh, by its history. I was talking to somebody, and uh, apparently K2 and Everest, they're still growing, which I think is fascinating. Apparently that area of tectonic plate is still moving upwards, so the altitude keeps changing. Ugh. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I don't know. I came here for the mountains, but that that stuff scares the shit out of me. I, I don't think I can handle it. <laughs> That's another. It's another level for sure. Yeah, yeah. I kind of just got my first taste of it just over a year ago, climbing Kilimanjaro, which is you know it's essentially just a long hike and a very uh, high hike. You know, the altitude can be quite a serious thing, but um, it kind of just I guess whet my appetite for getting into more serious mountaineering. Mm. I mean, clearly you need to be a mountaineer if you're calling Kilimanjaro a hike. That's, uh... <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it truly is, though. <laughs> My Viewfinder is a proud member of the Alberta Podcast Network. Locally grown, community supported. This week's episode is brought to you by ATB. Even now, good advice is within reach. Your financial situation today, tomorrow, or this very hour is why ATB is here. ATB will listen and help with the knowledge and solutions you need right now. Why? Because ATB was built to help Albertans. For more information, visit atb.com. Is there anything you miss the most about your past self? That's kind of a weird question, but I mean, is there a past self and is there something you miss about it? There definitely is a past self. Um, I'm not sure off the top of my head what I miss about it, but that past self is, um, you know, growing up, I, I wanted to be a professional athlete and that's kind of what I worked towards. It was school and sports, you know, it was kind of what was, uh, I guess, encouraged in my family. It was like, you know, do your sports. My parents were both great athletes. So that's kind of naturally what we just fell into and then, you know, do well in school as well. And so just kind of this overachieving academic athlete and yeah, I guess, the one of the most challenging things about that was you know realizing that okay you're not going to be a professional athlete and then coming to terms with that realizing that I hadn't put much thought into what I really actually wanted to do with the rest of my life 
and then spending, you know, the next eight years um, of my 20s trying to figure that out. And uh, yeah, that was kind of a whole, I guess, epoch of my life, just being in turmoil over, oh, wow, I spent, you know, all of my childhood, teenage years chasing this dream. It's not going to be a reality. What's next? Hmm. What, what was your sport? Uh, well, it started off with hockey, uh, ice hockey, and then I quit hockey to pursue rugby and track and field. And I had some success as a teenager with both of those and, you know, in terms of national rankings and uh, I guess certain teams I made and getting a crack to play for Team Canada and rugby um, as an 18-year-old <laughs> and, and then having it kind of all fall apart after that. Yeah, in Toronto, I remember there's this kid who joined one of our soccer teams, but he played probably national level junior hockey, and uh, his physical <laughs> conditioning was uh, far beyond anything I'd ever witnessed in my life. Because when uh, I guess people like you take it seriously, it's incredible the difference uh, that kind of focus. I mean, genetics and talent, but uh, Christ. Strong people. I I don't. Yeah. I can't even comprehend how much work you had to put into that. <laughs> yeah, it's it's looking back on it when I think about how many you know hours a week I was spending training. It's just insane, and I would love, and I loved it too. Like every minute of it, you know, like in my grade eleven and grade twelve years, it'd be rugby practice like every day after school, except for Friday. One of the days each week would be a game. But then, like, after rugby practice, I'd go to track practice for another two and a half hours. Um, and then on the weekends, like, if I didn't have a game or a tournament or anything, like, I would go out and do two-a-day workouts on the weekend just by myself because, like, that was, you know, the psychological win that, like, I felt I needed to, like, stay ahead of everyone else. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> this is why... Uh... Again, we call it the Kilimanjaro hike. It's pretty funny. <laughs> I won't stay on that. <laughs> I'm going to think about that a long time, Ryan. I uh, I think that's how I'll characterize you as uh, <laughs> in the way you said that. But, you know, I guess what I'm picking up on a lot is uh, both this idea of pivoting and changing, uh, adapting, but also a strong sense of discipline. Um it's uh, the discipline part is a concept that I have been both, I suppose, struggling with, but learning a lot about uh, in the fine art so-called world, where I think I had obviously this sort of um, um, assumption about this intuitive artist who just kind of throws paint at a wall. But as it turns out, particularly with photography, since we're photographers, uh, that is not at all how it works. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Like, how, how do you go from two and a half to five hours of athletics to picking up a camera and, uh, you know, uh, applying that energy into image, uh, yeah, creation. And it sounds like research, you know, what's the, what's the metamorphosis there? Yeah, that's a great question. It's a bit of a, it's a, it's a bit of a story and it, it took a number of years to kind of go from athlete Ryan to artist Ryan. Um, so, you know, while I was at U of A doing my engineering degree, um, I was competing in sports. I could play for the rugby team and the track thing for a couple of years. Um, my grades were really suffering uh, while I was doing track. So I ended up after two years of that um, and just too many injuries. The body was just not um, cooperating with me. So I called it quits with track and kind of just did the rugby thing for fun, um, focused on the academics and um that paid off you know had a, had a really good last two years of uh, my undergrad and then moved back to calgary and immediately started working as an engineer for a small consulting company uh that we did kind of corrosion mitigation engineering for oil and gas producers so yeah and then it's amazing looking back at how quickly those two years went and i've kind of always been I've always said to myself, like, I don't want to just like be in the job. Like, I just don't want to just do what everyone else is doing. And after, you know, a year and a half or so being in that job, I was kind of like, okay, I'm looking at where people older than me in these companies are. And like, do I want to have this kind of life in 10, 20, 30 years from now, uh, you know, as a 21, 22 year old 
And, uh, and the answer was no. And so basically I was like, I need to change. And I didn't really know what that change was, but, um, I started looking for opportunities elsewhere and, um, the opportunities that I ended up taking happened to be a, a PhD position in Christchurch, New Zealand. And, uh, it was actually kind of related to my job. It was in um, bio corrosion. So we were kind of doing materials engineering, material science to make uh, materials for biodegradable bone screws. So think about breaking a bone and lots of people will be able to relate to this. You, you break something and you've got to get it fixed. You get some screws and plates put in you. Um, and often they're made of things that don't degrade in the body, which is which is a really good thing for the most part, um, because uh, it keeps that bone stable and helps it heal. But then, what happens? You know, five, ten years down the line, after the bone's well healed um, and that implant starts to cause problems or you need to get it removed. So, basically, we were trying to you know come up with a material that um, can fix the bone, help it heal, and then it can be safely reabsorbed by the body to kind of get rid of that issue of. Uh, a second removal surgery that burden on both the healthcare system and of course the patient. Um, so that was basically the whole gap between 2015 and 2020 it was filled with that research. But while I was in New Zealand, um, about a year into it, I, I had a GoPro and I was just going on all these awesome hikes and exploring the country quite a bit in my spare time. So I just started making little videos um, and kind of putting them on YouTube. And, you know, at first it was basically just to show my family and friends back in Canada what I was getting up to and just, I guess, satisfying this creative itch that I had um, that hadn't really been present too much um, in earlier years. Although now I think back to my teenage years and stuff, and I did go through spurts of, you know, learning to play the, the guitar for a few years and you know writing super corny songs for girls and and writing poetry here and there as well so there were some like moments of creativity but um yeah it, i had never really had a desire to do it until i was just exploring this beautiful country and just got really inspired by the places that i was experiencing and seeing so it all began with a gopro just quickly on che cheesy, corny songs. I wrote and performed a song for my wife for a wedding. And uh, so drunk, I don't remember any of it. <laughs> this, is, this is why I'm sober now. I, uh... Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so what's interesting, uh, and I, I mean, this is a broad generalization, but I find that people in Calgary, uh, maybe even Western Canada, but... Um, Calgary in particular, because this is where I live now, they seem to have like a, a closer proximity to nature. Um, and it sounds like even though the original engineering piece was, uh, you know, maybe not directly environmental, um, you know, you, you've spoken about wanting to record um, this connection in nature while doing sort of bioengineering research. I think it's interesting, this sort of, yeah, this crossing between your two worlds, uh, your brain and your body. What was it, do you think, about the GoPro that started... You know, some people just become mountain climbers. They don't necessarily become vloggers, for lack of a better term. Um, mm -hmm. Was there something you think uh, that was happening around that time that, you know, were you getting good feedback, uh, you know, or was it just something compulsive where having the camera with you helped you be part of the environment? Mm, yeah, so I think one of the reasons that I... I started to kind of take it more seriously was that um, the research, my PhD research was not going well at all. And, um, you know, it was, it was quite depressing and it, it was very challenging for me to, to just be like, you know, why am I, why am I even here? Like it was kind of always like, Oh, like once this piece of equipment gets fixed, like we'll be okay. Or like, you know, once this happens, like you'll be clear and like off to the races with the research, but like it was just delay after delay after delay. And this was my escape really, you know, getting out into the mountains, hiking, doing backcountry camping, uh, going and looking for birds that became 
a way to kind of kind of release um, a meditative practice in a, in many ways and a challenge for me a new challenge because like obviously when any of us pick up a camera we really suck at first and <laughs> I kind of had the self awareness to realize that like I wasn't very good but that really motivated me to to want to get better and so yeah I think I just have this personality that when something catches my eye and takes my interest if i really want to dive into it i will completely immerse myself in it uh, and that's why i'm very careful with what i choose to you know put my time towards because i know that things can consume me uh, quite quickly it's incredible to hear or meet people who are self-aware yeah that's a great combination self-aware and disciplined that's uh, pretty rare right <laughs> Um, well, you know, if we skip a little bit, I mean, I think we've got a camera in hand, but now we've mentioned mountaineering and birds and from the brief time that I've known you, uh, you seem to like birds a lot. I, um, I don't know. I, you know, I was out with a friend and they told me that there are birds in Calgary and I said, yeah, I've seen these magpies everywhere, but apparently Calgary too is a quite a large birding. Uh, I didn't even know what birding was, uh. You know, what was it, uh, what is it about birds, Ryan? I, I don't know. I think they're, I mean, eagles are cool, but uh, generally they're kind of weird dinosaurs to me. But what is it about <laughs> nature and uh, and animals that that connects with you? As opposed mm -hmm. to, I don't know, a lot of standard fare, particularly in urban denses, you know, street photography or, or commercial stuff like portraiture. But, um, you know, what is it that took you away from your standard landscape and mountain peaks, which you have some really great shots, but into chasing wildlife? Yeah. So, oh man. I mean, when it comes to, yeah, to be honest, um, the wildlife thing is a bit more recent than just, you know, getting out there with a camera, but still very connected with the original reason why I got into kind of outdoor nature photography and filmmaking and so you know as i was out there uh exploring the backcountry of new zealand like i would have these cool experiences with wildlife <laughs> and in particular there's one bird uh that really you know was the reason for my now like kind of obsession with birds and that bird is called the kia uh it's about k-e-a and uh it is recognized as the world's only alpine parrot. They're very cool. So they, they live in the mountains, anywhere from kind of the forests on, you know, the in the valleys to the peaks of mountains. And they have kind of this interesting history uh, in New Zealand where there's at one point there's a bounty placed on them because farmers thought that they were uh, kind of eating their sheep in the night. <laughs> Believe it or not, the Kia would, uh, you know, they have a hunger for fat. Uh, and so they would jump onto the sheep's back in the middle of the night and peck like through their wool and actually like start eating them. And, you know, really it's, you can't blame them. They're just kind of uh, very resourceful and smart birds. And, but anyways, obviously the farmers didn't like that. So there was a bounty place on them and they were decimated. And now there's only, I think, I think they say between four and 7,000 of them left. And so, um, this bird just absolutely amazed me, not only because of how beautiful they are, but just because of how smart and curious they were. And, you know, just being able to kind of spend some time with a group of a few Kia in the middle of nowhere in the backcountry of New Zealand and see these birds and see their different personalities and individualism and how they're interacting with each other just kind of was like, wow, like, this is incredible. Like, I want to know more. And I think with wildlife and nature in general, I think there's just so much that we can learn from just kind of being out there observing. Uh, you said something else that um, I wanted to touch on. Yeah, I don't remember. Three hours wow. sleep. Uh, uh, or just... <laughs> That's okay. I, um, I did write down that you're fascinated by zombie parrots, which I think is great. They sound like something out of a... <laughs> Out of a movie, there. eating sheep live. That's that's something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> let me let me ask you this then. Um, 
you know, you brought up, I, I have a couple questions, but the, the last one I wrote here is、um, this idea of that humanity, generally speaking, should spend more time observing nature because nature, again, presumably has its own cycle figured out. Does that, has that given you, so the, in your、uh, practice, has that given you sort of an idea of where man or、uh, humans might fit in there? I mean, I, I don't think we know, but how has that experience sort of given you insight into maybe what, what should we be observing? And,、um, you know, what is it about nature that's been giving you, yeah, giving you this、uh, maybe insight or, or some kind of emotional response or whatever it is?、Um, What is it that interests、mm. you about that observation? So, this makes me think of like how you just kind of mentioned, like, I don't get what it is about birds. Like, you know, <laughs> like, and, and I don't think, I think for a lot of people,、uh, well, first of all, birds are great because they're, they're everywhere. As you said, like, you didn't know that there's many birds other than magpies and some crows and robins around Calgary, but. There's a lot of birds that, that come and visit our city, which is, which is really cool. So, the accessibility of birds、um, is really great. Kind of like a low barrier to entry. Like anyone can go and start looking at birds. But I think it's kind of like this idea of just getting out and observing and appreciating the world and nature. And so, I think people use kind of birding as a vehicle to get that same. Pay off, you know. Then there's other people who will, you know, go into the back country and look for wolves and lynx and moose. And like, that's you know, obviously a lot more difficult and、um, a lot more involved and takes a lot more resources and all that kind of stuff. But I think really the essence of those two things are the same. It's just getting out there and noticing、uh, because that's the thing, like. I look back at myself before I left Calgary back in whatever, 2013, 2014, and I was the same. Like, I had no idea that there were all these cool birds around Calgary. I didn't even know there's blue jays in Calgary. You know, like, there's blue jays in Calgary? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I thought that was a Toronto <laughs> thing, yeah. <laughs> yeah.、Um, so, yeah, it's just like actually stopping and noticing, like, even just going for a walk. In the neighborhood that I literally grew up in my whole life, now I notice all of these things that I never noticed previously.、Um, just because I made the choice to start noticing and to start asking questions like, oh, what's that? Like, you know, oh, I wonder what sound that is. Like, what bird makes that sound that I'm hearing now? And just really just kind of having this curiosity for, for everything that's around me. And I, so, yeah, getting. Back to、uh, how we started this, I guess. The birding is like a great way for people to connect with nature and also be a part of kind of like a community because, you know, birding is kind of like this, in a way, like this cult like thing, but it's so popular actually. Like, to people who like don't, aren't in the birding scene, they're like, oh my God, like you're a birder, but like, You go on Alberta, if you go, go on Facebook and look up Alberta birds, I don't know how many tens of thousands of people are, are in that group, but、um, uh, it's pretty impressive.、Uh, you know, and just getting to like share the excitement with people of like seeing a bird that you've never seen before in Alberta、um, and like get, snapping a cool photo of it, it's pretty cool. Yeah. I'm just, I should have realized that the、uh, word would be birder, but.、Uh... That'll be probably the name of your episode. <laughs> Ryan Wilkes <laughs> Birder. <laughs> okay. Please, no. <laughs>、uh, actually, actually what, I, what I hear,、uh, which I think is great, I mean, there are, of course, different people that will approach、um, any processes in a different way. But so, for example, in my mind, what I mean by that is there's going to be, let's call them checklist birders who are、uh, out to just chase to, you know, kind of show that everybody,、uh, that they've seen as many different species or locations as possible. And I'm sure that's going to be an element in anything that we do. But there's a spiritual side, it sounds like, with being present、uh, and becoming aware of the beauty, even in these mundane things like I. Yeah,、uh, I, after I met, I guess she's also a birder, my friend who's a birder.、Um, I have honestly heard、uh, bird noises a little bit 
more than I certainly would have before she even mentioned that there was, like you said, not just crows and geese. Um, but being present is a fascinating, that's a difficult, it seems so simple to just tell people to be present, but it's uh, a fascinating mm. process. But, but like for you, when you're going out and doing your street photography, like I'm sure it's quite a similar mindset and process. Actually, you're just observing what, what's going on in front of you. You're looking for certain uh, behaviors or repetition of, you know, patterns and uh, not only in like maybe architecture, but in the way people are acting, you know, and I think there's probably a lot of parallels you could draw between street photography and, and wildlife photography. Um, because, you know, you're, you have to be quick on your feet, I would say, um, in both, in, in both practices and you don't really have control over your subject <laughs> at all. You have to, uh, kind of just be reacting to, to what you see in front of you. So, yeah, I think it's probably actually not as foreign to you as you might think. <laughs> I would, this is a great segue to get into the relationship of the camera to this experience. Um, but before, quickly, I, I have this, I think it was in the Secret Life of Walter Mitty, but I, I think this is just a general um, paradigm for nature photographers. Are you out buried in snow for three days uh, with like a 400 millimeter lens <laughs> waiting for a bird to pass by? Or or like, what is, what is it like to be out there? Because uh, street photography... I mean, even shooting film, there's, uh, like you, you talked about, there's something reactionary about it, even when you're looking for a specific form. Um, but you're typically, I mean, nobody, I don't think people stay out more than a few hours uh, or pitch a tent, uh, you know, in, in front of Sheldon Shumi or something, uh, waiting for the right person to walk by. Um, you know, what is it like to go out into nature? I mean, I've seen some of your photographs. You're not just in a park. Uh, some of these look like fairly deliberate and intense uh, voyages um, I feel like there's something it takes a little bit more to do that yeah so you're you're right like definitely there are times where and the majority of times I'm going out with my camera are just to parks that anyone can access and you know oftentimes I'll just bring my wildlife setup with me when I go on hikes and have it like you know shoulder bag that's just kind of ready to go if I see anything interesting uh, while I'm hiking. But I'm kind of now in this transition where I am looking more into going on those trips, like you mentioned, like being waist deep in snow for three, five days and looking for a specific subject um, and, and only going out and looking for that subject after I've done a lot of research on where I can find it, um, how likely I am to find it how to position myself, what time of day, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so I think you're right in the fact that uh, to capture ex really exceptional images in wildlife photography, I think that quite a bit more planning goes into it than um, some other genres. Uh, but um, with that said, there's also, you know, I know wildlife photographers, or sorry, pardon me, I know landscape photographers that will plan shots six months out because, you know, that sun needs to be coming up right in that valley at the perfect angle and they need this weather window and these flowers need to be blooming. So, yeah, I think you can kind of apply those same planning practices to, to many different styles of photography. But, um, yeah, there's definitely a mix. Like, sometimes I'll get some of my greatest shot. Like, I got this amazing shot of this cedar waxwing uh in the springtime in Calgary, down um, near the Bow River. And I just happened to be going out for a walk in my home road for some birds and ended up hanging out with this pair of cedar wax ones for a good 30, 40 minutes. You know, they got comfortable with me and uh, ended up getting really close. And I snapped some of my favorite bird portraits that I've, I've ever taken. So um, as with most things, there's a bit of luck involved, but also preparation, and, yeah. So, here's today's challenge. I know it's cold, but next time you can get out, try to go for a walk, maybe even without your camera. Take a peek, have your ears open. Apparently, there are birds everywhere. Here's a weird anecdote. I was out with my friend Alvin on a street photography walk when I noticed a bald eagle above us. We were in Crescent Heights by the downtown core. There are apparently birds everywhere. 
If you're interested, there are apps that record and name birds just by their songs. I get it, but birds are weird, but I think Ryan's onto something. A few weeks ago, Julia told us that we should look at moss in the forest floor. Last week, Donna asked to see an owl. This week, Ryan's telling us that we should just get outside, go look at some trees, pay attention to the sky. Let's see if we can get connected to nature, not just through pictures, but by being part of them. Let me know if you see anything out there. Do you have a favorite sound? I mean, there's something about uh, rain, uh, just kind of the consistent percussion of rain that um, I've actually been using to fall asleep to quite a bit lately on Spotify. Just find like some some rain sounds and set a sleep timer for 15, 30 minutes and, and I'm out. So yeah, that's the, that's the first one that comes to mind. I'm always worried that if I use a rain uh, sound, I'll just end up peeing in bed. But... <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I never considered that, but now like maybe I'll have to change my sound because subconsciously I'll be like, oh, Dave said I might be myself. <laughs> I, I don't know. This is probably why I've lost so many friends. I, I speak out of turn and everybody starts uh, peeing in their beds and they're just like, no, I can't hang out with this guy anymore. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh... This episode is brought to you by Park Power, your friendly local utilities provider in Alberta. Park Power offers internet, electricity, and natural gas with low rates, awesome service, and profit sharing with local charities. In Alberta, you get to choose who to buy your internet, electricity, and natural gas from. If you switch providers, nothing changes about the delivery of these utilities to your home or business. If you have an existing contract, you're going to want to find out the terms before leaving. If you don't, then it's even easier to sign up for Park Power. You, as the consumer, have the choice of who you pay your bills to. Why not choose your friendly local utilities provider? Learn more at parkpower.ca.